Welcome back. Chapter 32 represents what we call meta-literature. It reflects back on the definitions and functions of literature itself. The idea is to summarize the moral and aesthetic purposes of the very novel we have been reading, and thus prepare us for the novel of the curious and pertinent in chapters 33 through 35, and the captive's tale in chapters 39 through 41. Our theoretical overview begins with a brief reiteration of bourgeois ethics, followed by a burst of erotic jokes. Heading toward their village, the priest, the barber, Sancho, and Don Quixote, accompanied by Dorotea and Cardenio, come to the end of the squirely blanketing, that is, the second end, the one run by Juan Palomeque and his wife, their daughter, and Maritornes. The knight's first gesture is to tell them that they should prepare him a better bed than before, to which the hostess replied that so long as he should pay for it better than last time, she would prepare him a bed fit for princes. Don Quixote said that indeed he would, and so they prepared him a reasonable one in the same loft as before. Don't overlook this brief negotiation. In the contexts of slavery, and the respective mistreatments and still unpaid wages of servants like Andres and Sancho, the fact that Don Quixote finally recognizes that he must pay for his room at an inn represents a major transformation. Now, once Don Quixote is in bed, the innkeeper's wife launches lascivious expressions at the barber. She demands the return of her ox's fine tail, buena cola, in which she hangs her comb, peine, thus making sexuality a theme parallel to that of commerce. How to understand this relation? I would argue that Cervantes seeks to expand the ways in which more traditional readers might understand the idea of economy. Notice, for example, that while Don Quixote, whom the narrator now calls the liberator of everyone, is sleeping, the priest and the innkeeper amplify the business arrangement already agreed to by our knight and the innkeeper's wife. The curate had them prepare whatever food was available at the end, and the host, hoping for a better payment, diligently prepared them a reasonable meal. Next, Cervantes gives us a fascinating look at early 17th century reading practices. Perhaps the most unusual detail is the fact that the innkeeper and Don Quixote share the same taste in novels. For example, when the priest announces that reading books of chivalry has driven Don Quixote insane, the innkeeper claims that there's no better reading in the world. He adds that at harvest time, many reapers gather in the inn and someone always reads aloud from one of these books. Here, Comments unleashed by members of the innkeeper's family recall the ancient debate which goes back to Plato's Republic over the moral and social value of fiction. First, the innkeeper admits that novels have a strong effect on him. When I hear of those furious and terrible blows struck by the knights, I'm seized by a desire to do the same. This should remind us of our own debates over the relation between real violence and art with violent content, such as video games or action movies. In point of fact, if one consults the chronicles of conquistadors like Hernán Cortés or Bernal Díaz del Castillo, it's obvious that the most violent men of the time read novels of chivalry. But wait, things aren't so simple. The innkeeper's wife adds that she also loves these novels, and precisely because they distract her husband. I never have a quiet moment in my house except when you're listening to somebody read, because you get so enthralled that you forget about arguing. And if that doesn't complicate things enough for you, now Maritornes says that she too loves these novels, especially when they tell about the other woman under the orange trees in the arms of her knight, and there's a maiden on guard nearby dying of envy. This alludes to a particularly funny episode of La Celestina. And topping all this, the priest now asks the innkeeper's daughter for her opinion. And she says, that the lamentations uttered by the knights when they are apart from their ladies, in truth, sometimes it seems so unfair, I want to cry. 
Finally, Dorotea's question goes directly to the issue of whether or not this type of literature promotes illicit sex among its readers. So, young lady, you would offer them relief if they were crying over you? Cervantes, amazing, in 1605, asking us, does art cause violence and sex? Note, too, how this exchange indicates that these novels functioned as violent epics for male readers and erotic melodramas for female readers. They're like Star Wars meets Jane Eyre.